So my name is Helena Molin Valdez, and I'm the head of the Secretariat for something called the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. You see the um, you see our translation channels on the on the screen over here. So I will start by briefly introducing the C40 Solo Solid Waste Initiative that we have together uh, with us in the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. And then we will have three very exciting presentations from three cities, uh, the city of Berlin, Houston, and Oslo, uh, and followed by a conversation up here on the podium. And uh, we have time for questions from the audience to, to the three speakers. Is that okay with everybody? Now that you hear me? Good, thanks. So, globally, waste management is responsible for 3% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. You probably are aware of that. And actually, because I'm working on short-lived climate pollutants myself, such as methane, black carbon, uh, and tropospheric ozone, one third, uh, two-thirds of all uh, methane emissions actually comes from the from the landfills so that's a big number in addition to the three percent of the total greenhouse emissions as you might know methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas in some cities especially with lower energy consumption the figures are much higher than three percent as well especially in regions like Latin America where waste management can be responsible for more than 14 or 15 percent of the total greenhouse emissions and of course, landfills is one of the major uh, focuses for that. Yes, here it comes. So waste generation is increasing faster than any other pollutant, including the CO2. We are all aware of plastic mountains uh, clogging our sewers, rivers, and oceans, and causing floods, which is the biggest problem, I think, but also economic and environmental damage. I used to myself work in, on disaster risk reduction programs and uh, leading a, uh, something called the Resilient Cities Campaign. And obviously, flooding uh, caused by improper waste management was one of our major problems in many, many cities. Um, it's also one of the largest costs to municipal budgets, as I'm sure you are all aware of. And the global perspective is pretty worrisome. During last century, um, of we all became more affluent and we are all consuming more. And in many countries, this is increasing extremely quickly. Look at China, for example, but many other parts of the world. And Last century, the waste generation increased tenfold over the, over the century, but by 2025, it's perceived to even double. And by the end of, the, of, the, of the, this current century, that if the trend continues, we will have more than triple amount of waste to take care of. It's a huge scenario to think through. Mm -hmm, next, yes. So, Waste management challenges are, of course, especially acute in emerging cities with increased consumption and demand for better services. Do we have somebody from Shanghai, Seoul, Rio, and Mexico City in the room? We have in the, in the building, and we heard some of them speak this morning. So, Leo Gang in Shanghai, Sudo Kwon in Seoul, Jardin Gramacho in Rio de Janeiro, and Bordo Poniente in Mexico City, they are all competing for the title of being the largest landfill in the world, with each receiving more than 10,000 tons of waste per day. So, this is part of the conversation we are going to have today, and I'm trying to get next slide doesn't work yeah so uh, of course not is all bad news and that's what we are going to discuss today and that's why we are working with C40 cities to, to tr reverse the trend and to look at um, opportunities for change and of course um, we heard even some examples this morning from the mayors talking this morning and just to add a few other ones um, cities in North America and European cities in particular have been demonstrating that by raising the disposal costs uh, there is a direct impact on waste generation. We heard the uh, Mayor Jensen this morning talk about Copenhagen 
And uh, in 1988, Copenhagen sent over 40% of its waste to landfill, and today it's less than 2%. It's quite impressive. And that's because they are implementing a very systematic, long-term integrated program uh, on waste management. In the 90s, San Francisco, California, set out to become a zero waste city by 2020 and uh, to divert all of its waste from landfills through uh, reduction and recycling. And uh, we had San Francisco with us in one of our events just recently and heard that they are now close to 80% of actually reaching this very ambitious goal. Uh, the three R's, reducing, recycling and reusing, that's what is guiding our, our work here. Oops. Let me go back again. So um, this morning, some of you or all of you probably heard the, the launch of the C40's um, um, Climate Action in Megacities 2.0 report. I have to quote Cristiana Figueres here, and I haven't read it neither, and I, I promise to do this this afternoon as soon as I get a copy of the report. But just to, to take out some of the figures that C40 cities are reporting on related to waste management, which is pretty encouraging. Uh, out of the 8,000 actions, 1,039 are in the waste management sector, so it's a good number. 65% of the climate actions that are being taken in the waste management sector are reported as being transformative, and that's the highest of any of the sectors. And this means that the changes reported on are uh, impacting on the whole city. 50% of waste actions are related to the treatment of waste. 40% relates to waste reduction, which I'm personally very encouraged by. And 10% refers to the waste collection, all of which contributes also heavily to, to greenhouse gas emissions. 30% of organics management actions focusing on source separation policies. I know that we will have some diverting, diverting ideas about this in our, in our panelists, which will be good. We have 86% of the C40 cities reporting on intention to expand their waste management actions that are not already transformative, with a particular focus on waste source separation policies. So it's very good news. So I just, uh, I just will go through a few minutes also on our current partnership between the C40 cities and the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to reduce uh, short-lived climate pollutants. As you know, the C40, in addition to being a networking organization, it's also pursuing um, specific partnerships that will help the cities to deliver high value and, uh, and uh, ex uh, accelerate action among cities. And this is where the coalition that I'm leading comes into to being. Our coalition for climate and clean air uh, was launched in 2012, a little bit less than two years ago. It's a coalition of governments. It was launched by six countries and UNEP and has since expanded to more than 75 partners, half of them countries, half of them roughly international and, and specialized NGOs, private sector entities uh, and others. Uh, we are focusing mainly on what we call the sh reduction of short-lived climate pollutants, such as, uh, I mentioned already, methane, which is very related to the waste sector, black carbon, a big component of um, PM 2.5, and also uh, a big polluter when it comes to burning of waste, um, tropospheric ozone and hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs. And our purpose in the coalition is to reduce near-term impact on climate to be able to retain the 2, two degrees Celsius as, uh, as, as has been agreed upon globally in a short term and a near term. But most importantly, it's about increasing health benefits and um, avoiding much of the 3 million deaths of today that's actually a result of air pollution. And also to increase crop yields, which are heavily affected by in particular tropospheric ozone to which methane is one of the uh, major contributors. So we are really talking about development here and more livable societies by reducing um, air pollution and working on clean air. So with C40 we have been working since the very beginning and we launched together in, during the Rio conference uh, on sustainable development in June last in 2012. Um, um, 
the initiative on municipal solid waste, and it was launched then by Mayor Bloomberg, New York, former President Bill Clinton, and then Governor Babatunde Fashola of Lagos. And they encouraged uh, many cities to join this initiative and work together um, to reduce short-lived climate pollutants as one of the many strategies for sustainable cities and, and, and climate action. So this partnership uh, of the coalition, in addition to the C40 Cli Cities uh, Climate Leadership Group, uh, we have ISWA with us, the International Solid Waste Association, a very important partner, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Environment Canada, the Ministry of Environment of Japan, uh, and an entity called IGES of Japan, which specialized in waste management, the Global Methane Initiative, the World Bank, of course, my base organization, UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, and the Center for Clean Air Policy, and a few others. Um, so the intention of this initiative and program is to bring together technical experts, policy makers, and city managers to plan and, and take action in a systematic way. I just wanted to mention also, because we have Cristiana Figueres with us in, in this conference, that the coalition, uh, the, clean, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, work mainly on short-lived climate pollutants, but of course the long-term objective of all of us is to to make this complementary to reducing CO2, which is the real, um, you know, where we will make the real difference in terms of global, global warming. Uh, so the, our initiative uh, of the CCIC, the, the coalition with C40, is working with the, the world's leading cities to tackle these sources of emission. Those include the capping and closing of open dumps, capturing and utilizing landfill gas, uh, and proper waste handling, especially on the organic uh, waste. And specific activities include uh, city assessments to identify and quantify the short-lived climate pollutant emissions from the waste sector. Uh, it provides opportunities for direct technical assistance on projects, policies, and overall capacity building efforts from any of the partner organizations that I just mentioned before. Uh, it's a platform for exchange of knowledge, expertise, and experience with like-minded city. We have our next major meeting for Asian cities in Surabaya later this month, and it's going to be back-to-back to a ministerial 3R meeting that is organized on an annual basis in the region. Uh, and we are strengthening linkages to national policy framework and financing. I listened carefully to the discussion this morning among, among the mayors on this particular subject. And of course, it's also a global recognition of city actions to improve waste management and to reduce the emissions to be reported on in the reports such as the one this morning. So in the first phase of this initiative, which was launched in 2012, uh, as we said, we worked with 10 cities uh, and they pledged to reduce the emissions and to also shape the program further and expand it into new cities. And during this first phase, C40 as one of the major partners brought several cities to the table, among them Rio de Janeiro, Lagos, uh, Lima, who's Dhaka and Ho Chi Minh City. And, uh, the C40 cities of New York and Stockholm joined a bit later and are, are acting as leaders and mentor cities in the initiative. So it's all about bringing cities together, same philosophy as C40, and linking it to very specific technical cooperation opportunities and, and moving forward, mentoring others and taking action in each of the cities that are joining the initiative. We have now launched the second phase of this initiative and it's designed to scale up and grow uh, both as a network and as a knowledge platform among the cities, uh, including case studies, etc. Uh, just to mention a few actions already taken. Rio, for example, uh, and Mayor Pais is not here, but he has excellent staff working on ways that we, that we know. Rio is looking to optimize its collection routes to reduce its fuel consumption and carbon footprint, improve its landfill operations and leachate management and working with large generators to divert organics from landfills and producing soil amendments for forestry projects. Very specific activities. Stockholm is improving its technological processes for resource recovery to enable them to also recycle textile fibers and a few other things. Lima 
uh, who has been active and participating in the cooperation, is on the path of implementing a large-scale restructuring of their waste management system and is looking to significantly reduce the amount of organics uh, to send to landfills. Addis, Addis Ababa is looking to improve their collection efficiency and disposal procedures and uh, is also seeking collaboration from other cities to develop comprehensive long-term integrated waste management planning. And finally, San Francisco of California. We also work with little San Francisco in Cebu region in Philippines, but this is San big San Francisco in California. We'll provide advice and mentorship to other cities and it's also seeking to learn more about the food waste to energy policies through this initiative. So, let's go to our panel now. And let's listen to, to some concrete experience of cities in the room. Uh, these are actions, the ones that I mentioned in the partnership we have with C40 and CCAC, um, that are taken by C40 cities, but there are many others, of course. Uh, it's all about transformative action, and we are looking for real lessons to be learned, but also best practices to be shared to enable cities to accelerate the activities. Costs is an issue, of course, population, engagement, people, citizens, demand, etc. Um, from our perspective and the coalition's perspective, it's also very much an issue related to, to health benefits, to productive benefits such as on, on crop yields, as I mentioned before, and of course, ultimately also the climate benefits and, and social sustainability and social e equity. So, in this session, uh, we will invite three speakers one after the other. They will come and present uh, their case and their experience to us and afterwards we will have them all in front here and we will be, you will be able to ask questions and we will have a conversation about where do we go next. So the speakers are Christian Gebler, who is the Permanent State Secretary of Berlin. It's Laura Spanjan, Director of the Office of Sustainability of the City of Houston. And we have the governing mayor, Stian Berger Rösland, of the city of Oslo with us. And uh, please um, help me to welcome our first speaker to the podium, which is Mr. Christian Gebler, the permanent state secretary of Berlin. Christian, please. Thank you very much, Helen, for your introduction. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to see you all today. Hmm. I think this is, will be better. Okay. I'm not sure you can hear me clearly. Okay. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to see you all today at the C40 Cities Major Summit, which brings together so many cities from various continents and gives us all uh, the opportunity to consider our environmental problems from different perspectives. And I would also say a great thank to the host city of Joburg and all the lovely people doing a great job, including as well the officials and the staff of C40. Thank you very much. We were aware as C40 member city that we ourselves contribute to the environmental problems which we are facing. Therefore, we have a particular interest in developing sustainable policies in order to prevent several damage to the environment. The rapid urbanization which we are experiencing must be accompanied by sustainable urban development in the natural forms of cooperation and networking like C40 are needed if we are to achieve a transformation into sustainable societies and to adapt urban spaces, energy systems, and the systems of land use to changes in the climate. Waste management is often a bit underestimated in public opinion, but really crucial part of sustainable city development. At first, some... Hmm. Some 
to the left? Or to the sorry. Ah, okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, first, some uh, words about Berlin, because I hope everyone knows where it is, but uh, I don't know if you know every figures about our city. Berlin is not only the capital of the Federal Republic of Germany and the largest German city, but also one of the 16 federal states of Germany. So we are state and city in one. Berlin is located in a landscape of forests, parks, and lakes, which cover almost 40% of the city's surface area. Uh -huh. It's also a great place to live. There are green breathing space throughout Berlin, offering restful retreats. Few cities have so much green space or so many lakes and rivers. Our city has prioritized uh, family-friendly initiatives and childcare. Berlin's districts offers great living and working environments and we have a modern transport infrastructure and a good public transport system. Living costs are still comparatively low, even if the economic upswing is reducing the gap to other major urban areas. With, with 3.4 million residents, Berlin is relatively small in comparison to cities such as New Delhi, which has six times more residents. And so our environmental policies and our strategies to supply infrastructures and waste disposal will obviously differ. Nevertheless, we all face the same question, what to do with the waste, which is the downside of our growth-oriented way of living, and what is the effect on CO2 emissions and how could these be reduced? This is increasingly becoming a crucial question for our expanding cities. In 2010, 3.5 million tons of waste were generated every day worldwide, but the predictions are that this will almost double by 2025 due to the rapid growth in the emerging economies. We must ask ourselves what is to be done with this waste and how it can be handled in an environmentally accessible way or recycled. The answers to the question will differ. Since 2005, landfill dumping of untreated waste has been banned in Germany whereas the former landfill site to the east of New Delhi has grown over 25 years to use, of use to become a waste mountain. The waste problem is also linked to a social question. In many countries, the separation of waste and its disposal is manual work, and many people live as waste collectors or backyard recyclers. It will not be possible in all countries for waste management to become an attractive business model for large, specialized disposal companies. And resource conservation, in particular, lives from the sense of responsibility of the individual, and this has to be encouraged. We therefore welcome UN United Nations projects like that in Peru, which aim at establishing waste collection as a recognized occupation. All of German institutions have a dedicated engineer in Bangalore in India to set up a recycling company for electrical and electronic waste, which already employs 90 women in accordance with health and safety standards. Our waste policies, our waste management policies in Berlin also depend on the cooperation of the city residents. This began with, begins with waste avoidance. Only recently, the Berlin City Administration gave an award to an initiative in Berlin which had set up a cafe where people can take their electric appliances to repair these with the support of volunteer experts. 70% of the appliances, such as desk lamps, radios, kettles, toasters, printers, CD players, and others, can be given a second life, and this is a remarkable result. Repair cafes, so named repair cafes, promote sustainability, extend the useful life of products, and encourage the reuse of materials. This is good for the environment, reduces the accumulation of waste, and the emission of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and also means that less energy is consumer for the production and transport of new products. Since the beginning of the 90s, there has been a significant decrease in the amount of waste for disposal in, 19, in Berlin. In 1992, there was 2,325,000 tons of waste for disposal, but this has fallen by 2012 to only 822,000 tons. This is a reduction of more than 60%. It is the result of increased activities to promote waste prevention, separate collection, and waste recycling. 
In view of the rising prices of raw materials and the global limitations on primary res resources, waste management today also faces the challenge of supporting the recovery of secondary resource. There's a talk of coming resource of a coming resource crisis for the manufacturing sector. The European Commission is developing strategies in response of these developments and it works programs for 2014 that pro proposes paying increased action to resource efficiency and recycling in a closed loop economy. Recycling requires a separate collection of waste stream. In Berlin, different bins and containers are provided in order to achieve these. They are placed in the backyards to make it more comfortable for citizens to separate their waste. This is a different to many other regions in Germany where we have to bring recyclable materials to recycling stations outside of the housing areas. In 2013, a new bin was introduced in Berlin for light packaging together with other valuable plastic and metal recyclables such as toys, pots, and pans, tools, or plastic bowls. This makes recycling easier for residents. We expect to collect an additional 25,000 tons of recyclables every year. Additional, at 50 recycling stations in the city with six collection points for harmful substances, members of the public can hand in domestic recyclable substances, for example, bulky waste items, wood, scrap, paper, electric, and electronic waste, as well as problem waste. Um, every year, the recycling stations collect some 140,000 tons of recyclable materials and 3,000 tons of harmful waste. Um, coming back to the slide here, you can see some of the bins. It's not all because we have different colored containers which are provided in the backyards. Uh, blue ones for paper, green, white, and brown ones for various colors of glass. Yellow and orange for packing and similar materials brown for organic waste and gray for residual waste. Um, you can see this is also a question of informing the people what to do in which bin. And so it's also a part of our policies to convince people to use these uh, different containers uh, right. Residual waste and the organic waste are collected by the city's own company, BSR. The collection of packaging is a privatized national system named DSD which is tendering the contracts every three years. Other recyclable waste uh, is collected by several waste management companies. Since June 2010, the public company BSR, um, the private company Alba, who collect the packaging and similar materials, and the Natural Conservation Foundation Berlin, have been carrying out a campaign, Trendstadt Berlin, a separating town Berlin, to encourage the separation of waste for recycling. Grants are given to worthy initiatives and projects in order to draw attention to the important contribution the thoughtful handling of waste can make to environmental protection and the conservation of resources. The target groups include children, young people, ethnic minorities, small businesses, tenants, and landlords. A total of 640,000 euros is available and annually for action groups, private individuals, and businesses. This is paid by DSB, the German package recycling system. So, um, in Berlin-Hellersdorf, the private company Alba operates one of Europe's most modern sorting and processing plants for light packaging waste, such as plastics, metal, and composite packing, which has been collecting in the recycling bins. The plant operates as a high, at a high technical standard with various optoelectronic and near-infrared uh, controlled operations. Um, while the amount of waste for disposal has declined, the amounts being recycled have increased markedly since 1992, whereas only 269,000 tons of a total volume of waste of 2,594,000 tons was recovered in 1992. The recovered amount has more than doubled in 2012. So, proportionally, uh, this repents an increase from some 10% in 1992 to more than 40% in 2012. In May uh, 2011, the Berlin House of Representatives approved a long-term waste management strategy for Berlin. This creates the boundary, the boundary conditions for the preventions, prevention of waste and the handling of all waste generated in Berlin for planning periods throughout until 2020. The city of Berlin wants to be a pioneer in waste management. 
And this is done in partnership with the city's own waste management company, BSR, which is one of the largest municipal waste management utilities in Europe. It has around 5,300 employees and a fleet of some 1,600 vehicles, of which more than 1,200 are for special purposes. Um, just two uh, little remarks on this um, two plants. Um, we have a waste incineration plant uh, where waste to energy, uh, waste to energy heating power station with an annual capacity of 520,000 tons of waste. Um, there we get uh, heat for running a turbine at the power plant to get energy from this. And so for each ton of waste input, the MPS plants achieve an average reduction of greenhouse gas emissions of some 460 kilogram CO2 equivalent. The other, okay. did you stop it? Ah, okay, there. The other interesting thing I think is uh, our biogas uh, plant, um, where we get um, from um, bio, uh, from, from organic materials, we get their gas to run the, uh, the, the, uh, the cars of the uh, waste management company, the public waste management company. So there we also will have an um, annual capacity of 60,000 60, tons, and this will be a recovery of ma materials and energy in an equivalent to more than 200,000 tons CO2 by 2020. So you see, it's a lot to say about uh, Berlin waste management, but I've been running out of time. So, um, just one remark, we have one of the lowest waste collecting fees in Germany. This is also important, I think, for the people. It's not only a question of uh, uh, sustainability, but also of economy. Um, in the last three years, we uh, lowered the prices uh, one time, and, and other years, it was more stable. So, I think a sustainable waste management can also be economic for the, for the people. Um, so, if you are interested to know more about Berlin Waste Management, we'll be there for you um, for, to, for now. Thank you for your um, cooperation. Thank you for listening to me, and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Christian, from Berlin. Uh, we will have opportunity to continue the conversation with you and the other speakers uh, just after. So please keep your questions to yourself. So let me now uh, invite Laura Spanjan. She is director of the Office of Sustainability of Houston. Hello. How's everybody? Are you awake after lunch, maybe? Okay. Waste and trash usually doesn't you know, inspire huge passion, but let's, we'll try to be passionate uh, for the next few minutes about this, because I, I am passionate about it. So I'm Laura Spangen. I'm the director of the Office of Sustainability for the city of Houston. Uh, you heard our mayor speak earlier today about some of the things that Houston is doing. And um, one of them is waste. So. Just to give you kind of a sense for those of you who haven't traveled to Houston or don't quite know where it is, we are a large city in the United States, fourth largest city, 2.1 million people, 6 million in our metropolitan. Um, we're a very sprawling city of 600 square miles. You can see the, 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 large, the large sprawl represented by the lights in, the, in this photo. Um, and as you know, we are the energy capital of the United States and many, in many respects, the oil and gas capital and trying very hard to, to be uh, the renewable energy capital as well. So that's a little background on Houston. Just to kind of dive into this, because I, I know we started a little bit late. So our, just to kind of give you a context of where our waste work is coming from. So our city of Houston emissions, um, not unlike most cities, most of it is in our building energy usage. More, a little bit more so in Houston, because we're a very hot and humid city. And so our buildings use tons of air conditioning, and so we have, we have sort of more energy usage, I think, than a lot of cities. Uh, we're also a sprawling city, and so we have lots of people drive in their cars, they commute, so our emissions come from transportation. We're definitely trying, trying to change that. 
Um, and um, about 10% comes from waste, most, most of that from methane from our landfills. Um, just to touch on the two areas that, um, before I get, get to waste, some of the areas of where we, where we are a leader, because we're not a leader in waste yet, but we're trying to get there. Um, as the mayor said earlier, we're the largest producer, um, Texas is the largest producer of wind energy in the United States. Uh, by the end of 2015, they should have, we should have 18,000 megawatts of wind energy produced just in, just in Texas, which is pretty amazing. Um, we've benefited from that. We're the largest municipal purchaser of renewable energy, and we buy wind from our wind farms in, in Texas. Um, we're also, also a leader in municipal building energy efficiency, um, really, really trying to uh, lower the energy usage of our city buildings. We've retrofitted 120 buildings, have another 20 on deck, and hopefully more after that. So we really want to make our buildings energy efficient and be sort of lead by example. On the transportation front, in that bucket of emissions, the things we're doing, you also kind of heard from the mayor, three new rail lines are coming online. Um, we've got a BRT line coming. Uh, we are expanding our you know, hike and bike trails. We have a $200 million uh, bike initiative that was passed last year. We're trying to build complete streets. Um, we're very invested in electric vehicles, trying to in encourage uh, people to buy electric vehicles. So everything we can do to try to, get, to, try to reduce those, those tailpipe emissions in city. So the third area, which leads us to our discussion today, waste. We, we ha you know, the mayor said earlier today also, we're, we're not proud of our, our waste numbers. When, when she was mayor, when she first became mayor t in, um, a few years ago, our, our, our diversion number was 2%. That is, that is awful. So we started to figure out, started to kind of think about what could we do to increase that. Now, there's a couple reasons our diversion is so low. One is we don't have a waste fee. We're one of the few cities that just has no fee. It's great to hear that Berlin's is, Berlin's is so low. Most cities that have high diversion rates have a very high fee. That's how they, that's, they pay for it. We have no fee and we have very low landfill costs. So it hasn't been a high priority for administrations to do it, but it's been a priority for us because we want to reduce our emissions and we want, we want to be a leader in all areas. So um, our diversion rate started to go up in 2010. We introduced single stream recycling. recycling. We increased our dual stream education, those, those bins that are, you see right there. Um, and we implemented a mandatory compostable bag yard waste program so people could um, compost their yard waste. So our numbers went up, that was good. Um, last few years has gone up even more. We're now at 22%. Uh, most households are on single stream recycling. But when you look at our, if you look at that number of 22%, only 8% of that is actually recycl recyclable materials. The rest of it is yard waste that people are composting. So while we were doing this, we asked ourselves, what could we do better? You know, what, you know, what, what's going on out in the waste world? And there, there's, you know, if you look at the average, the United States, the, the average of recycling rates um, in the U.S., it's hovering around 34%. And that's after many decades of recycling education and sorting and, and all kinds of things. You know, the, the number is still, the average is still hovering on 34%. The cities like San Francisco and others are very few and far between. There's not many cities, you know, hitting 80% targets. So we, we sort of realized, you know, we're Houston, we're a city of innovation. What, are there new technologies out there? What, what is the future of waste in the, in the U.S. Or, or globally? And can we try to figure out how we can do better um, than, than what has traditionally be, been done by separating out recyclables from trash. So it kind of led to this perfect storm. We started doing research. We took tours in Europe, uh, England and Germany, and tours, tours in California, did research in, in some innovative things happening in Canada. Uh, we had m tons of meetings and discussions about this. Um, I'm really very, very um, um, thankful to C40. I will forever be indebted to them on this issue, and particularly Ricardo Cepeda Marquez, who's now head of the Waste Network for the C40. Congratulations. Um, he was an in integral member of helping us kind of, he actually, they actually wrote a report for us, sort of a third party review, to see if we were, the, the things that we were thinking about, were we on the right track? Was this crazy, or was this something that we thought um, we, we could actually do, do differently? And they said, uh, you know, you're, th you're, you're kind of thinking in the right direction, keep working on it. And we also um, worked with AREP and the C40 on a waste innovation tool. So where we got to, we, we call it, we, our little name for it right now, it may change in the future, is called One Bin, really technically One Bin for All. So the whole idea is instead of sorting out all of your different things, which is what we've been taught to do for years, the idea is instead put everything, it's almost like you're going back to the future, put everything into one bin and let all of it, everything, go to a facility um, and use technology to sort the materials 
into different commodity streams and then take those streams and do things with them um, and either make money for the city or, or increase your diversion or both. So this diagram is a little bit hard to see, but the three major areas where we, we, we think there's innovation and we think it's kind of the future of waste is, you know, they separate out the, when you, when you get that one bin, right? It dumps on the floor, get the recyclables out. That's just basic, right? The aluminum cans, plastic, all of that. Second piece is the food waste. Uh, food waste is a really hard problem for people. Most people don't, have any, don't know how to do anything with food waste, and that's where most of the methane uh, emissions come from. So we'd take the methane, or the food waste, and we'd either put it through an anaerobic digester, create, create, meth, uh, create um, a gas that we could use, or compost it, or both. And then the last area is, is some of the residuals that um, either are contaminated or you can't do, any, uh, do much with. And we're looking at innovative uh, waste to fuel options that do not increase greenhouse gas emissions, do not have a constant fuel source that is needed to power the operations. Uh, there's some innovative technologies that are being worked on right now, catalytic conversion and others that can do this without increasing your emissions. So those are kind of the three pots that we've been looking at. Um, and we worked, you know, sort of really hard to ensure that, that where we, the path we were going down could, you know, potentially be, be successful. And we had goals. We had goals to, um, to guide our, um, our work. So the mayor, who's very supportive of this, um, we wanted to ensure one thing. We wanted to ensure that we were going to divert a lot of materials. We didn't want to go down this path and, and not divert anything, right? So we had a goal of 55% initially, 75% within two years of a, of a facility being operational. We wanted ease of use for our residents. We wanted to decrease G greenhouse gas emissions. No way were we going to do anything that increased from where we were today. We wanted a cost neutral or cost positive project. A lot of, you know, some of these projects are very expensive and they don't make sense economically. If it doesn't make sense economically, we're not, we're not going to be able to do it. Um, and we wanted to create jobs. So those were our goals. At the same time, um, as we were kind of working on trying to get company, talking to companies, we won a, a Bloomberg Philanthropies Mayor's Challenge Grant. So we won, we won this grant with this idea, a million dollars, to help us actually move this project forward. So we're very, very... Um, very grateful for uh, Mayor Bloomberg and his staff to give us support to kind of work this idea forward. Um, we also, as I said earlier, created a tool to help us analyze new technologies, right? We, we realized we were kind of out on our own doing our own research, right? With, with, you know, we have staff, but you know, it's limited staff. And so we said, hey, is there some help we can get out there to analyze new technologies? Because there's a lot going on in this field right now in, in, with innovative new technologies. So Arab helped us create a tool that other cities can use. We have many cities actually using it to help them analyze new technologies depending on what their goals are. Um, so it's a great tool, and I'm happy to make it available to anybody uh, who, who would like to use it. Um, so the Mayor Challenge Grant put our um, idea on the map um, because it, it was a national competition. Um, it created a national discussion, which was important. A lot of people, you know, there's a bad taste in the United States for this kind of commingled idea. Back in the 80s, people sort of tried it. It was called a dirty MRF, um, and it had, you know, it, it didn't work. It failed. The technology wasn't ready. The, the, they weren't able to separate it using technology at the time, so it left a bad taste in people's mouths. So we had to educate people that we weren't, you know, this is sort of, this is the new generation. This isn't an old dirty MRF technology. We actually are using new technologies that we think can actually separate out all these different commodities. So it was, it created a big dialogue for us, but it was a good dialogue because we were able to educate People, uh, people and ourselves uh, at the same time. The tool also helped us um, that we use because there are other technologies out there that we just hadn't captured. And so some of those are actually, we're actually speaking to because we were, had the help of AREP and C40 to help us uh, analyze uh, new technologies that are just coming onto the market. So for us, um, where we're at today, and it's, you know, this is, this is a big deal. I mean, it may not work, we'll be honest. I mean, this may not, you know, any one of our goals, our goals are, are big. <laughs> And if, if even one of them fails, you know, it's going to, it's not, our, our program probably won't work. But we're, we're confident enough that we think we can meet all of those goals. That's why we put them out there. Uh, we put an RFQ on the street last year. We had 11 firms bid, which was very exciting for us because we had some people bid that we hadn't even been talking to that much. And, and, and so we had a lot of interest. And uh, so we're in the process of shortlisting those right now. And then moving, uh, moving forward uh, on an RFP to get real concrete proposals and financial, you know, financial information to be able to, to move forward. So we're hoping that in the next four to six months, I'll be able to report 
that we were successful and we have a contract in place uh, with a private sector partner to help us build a facility that can get us um, to meet the goals uh, that we have when it comes to waste diversion and ultimately really reducing greenhouse gas gases and hopefully uh, not only making our costs stay the same, but hopefully um, actually having the city um, earn, earn some money from our, what most people think of as trash. So I just want to thank you so much for uh, having here today. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. I know that, I know that uh, we, are, uh, we are kind of going against the grain. I sometimes feel like I'm a salmon swimming uphill um, because we are doing something very different um, than what a lot of cities are doing. But again, if this can work, this could work for a lot, not just cities in the United States, but it could, it could be a very um, great program for a lot, of, a lot of cities internationally as well. So thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your time. I also just wanted to uh, call out our, our senator from the state of Texas, who's a huge supporter of all our sustainability initiatives, traveled with the mayor here today, and he, he's in the audience, Senator Rodney Ellis. I just wanted to call you out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, and we all love salmon, so we'll see where it takes us this time. I think this was a very good uh, uh, expression of also where politics and policy meets technology and technical solutions. And in the end, the people comes into the equation through behavior and will follow the, the development. So I'll call upon our last speaker uh, now. It's um, the city of Oslo and uh, Mayor Stian Berger Rösland is, yes, there you are, thank you, please. Ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon. And I can uh, start with a, a confession. I, I did not go into politics when I was 15 years old, imagining I would give a speech on waste management um, some years later. However, it's important that we do it. And let me also say that we debate how we manage waste. And I think it's also important to remember that, at least in my part of the world, our main objective is to reduce our consumption uh, because we consume too much. But the, the waste uh, handling is then something we need to do in order to uh, make a more um, a be better city and, and a better world. I would also like to thank the C40 for organizing this uh, session, and uh, I think it's fair to say it really represents a challenge, but also an, an opportunity. So everyone knows, of course, where Oslo is. Let's see. There we are. Um, Oslo is uh, uh, the capital of uh, Norway. We have around 630,000 inhabitants and uh, growing. Uh, we are among the fastest growing cities uh, in Europe. Uh, our goal is to uh, cut the emissions of greenhouse emissions by in half by the year of 2030. And we shall be, shall be carbon neutral by the mid of this century. This requires, of course, a broad range of measures, uh, and in particular, I think it's important to phase out oil-fired heating, which in a cold city like, uh, like Oslo in the winter uh, is a strong driver for uh, emissions. Uh, and we also need to reduce emissions from uh, vehicles. We have established a circle-based waste management system that contributes towards these two measures in addition to reducing the emissions from the waste itself. The city's responsibility for waste treatment is of course as old as the city, more than 1,000 years old. And I think it's fair to say that during the last century there was a change in attitude and focus on how we uh, regard uh, our waste. We have moved from uh, how to get rid of the waste by transporting it outside of the city to a dump towards now how to, how to get hold of it. Today, waste res is uh, a resource that we util utilize as raw material uh, in, to industry and to energy production. Um, and uh, some of the more recent development system is uh, shown on this slide. Household waste is sorted by citizens themselves in their own home into various fractions. We sort into paper, 
to food waste uh, and plastics that are collected every week from uh, each household. Metal and glass packagings and, uh, packaging and textiles are delivered to more than 750 recycling points all around the city. We also uh, collect uh, hazardous waste twice a year from each household. Uh, and in addition, you can also uh, deliver it yourself uh, to more than 30 specialized collection, collecting points in, in the city. Um, two modern uh, recycling stations take care of uh, all bulky waste, and one new is uh, under construction. And in addition, we have eight local recycle centers serving uh, many citizens in our inner city who uh, do not have their own car, which we are happy they do not have. Um, today, 38% of Oslo's waste uh, is material that is recycled or uh, reused, while 58% is energy recovered. Less than 4% is deposited on landfills. We have built uh, the world's largest optical sorting plant to separate bags with food and plastic from uh, uh, the inhabitants' uh, waste. The food waste is handled uh, in a new biogas uh, plant that opened in 2012. And uh, the rest of the waste is in a, in, uh, incinerated into two uh, waste to energy plants. And plastic, glass, paper, and uh, cardboard, as well as metal, is sold for uh, recycling. Our new uh, open biogas plant transforms uh, Oslo's uh, uh, food waste into biogas and biofertilizer. And the biogas is used for fuel for buses and waste trucks, which I think we see there. Um, uh, and uh, the bio is a fertilizer for uh, local farmers. The plant will produce enough uh, biogas to run about 150 buses and thus providing us with cleaner air, less noise and reduced greenhouse gas emission. In addition, it provides uh, about 100 medium-sized farms with biogas bio fertilizer each year. The total energy production from waste incineration is about uh, 1 TWH, uh, terawatt, and the heat energy meets the needs of about 84,000 households uh, through the district heating system, while the electricity production is equivalent to the consumption of all schools in the city of Oslo. Um, communication and is, the, is the key to change attitudes towards waste handling and to change uh, behavior. And our communications efforts have been made into three steps. First, we need to build an awareness uh, of what of how and of when. And this has been done through leaflets, to posters, campaigns, ads, social media, of course, as well as traditional media. The next step is uh, to create a positive attitude and positive reinforcements by, for uh, instance, headlines such as, you are contributing to a better environment. And the third step has been to build further knowledge and to kill myths uh, to make sure that the public have faith in the system. And one example of uh, how we ensure public knowledge and participation is to visit people where they live. And you can see everyone has to uh, do their part. Last year, our people knocked on 72,000 doors, which in a city of 630,000 inhabitants are quite a lot. And we actually took inspiration uh, from a city in the C40 network, London, who had done uh, the same in the borough of Bexley. And two weeks ago, I visited myself uh, an area in, uh, in Oslo called Ellingsru, together with people from the Agency of Waste Management. And my experience was that uh, residents had a positive attitude towards the waste management system. They knew about it, and they also uh, wanted to be part of it. They had some questions, however. Uh, for example, uh, what to do with eggshells, um, which were a quite common question. Um, so uh, we can uh, be able to answer the, uh, those questions that they had and also show them how to find answers online or on social uh, media. 
opinion polls show that 98% of uh, the inhabitants in, in Oslo are aware uh, that source uh, separation has been extended to include food waste and pl plastic packaging. And 81% says that their house, household do, sorts, uh, do sort out this fraction. The achievement so far um, is that each of Oslo's uh, citizens now sort out five kilo, uh, kilograms of uh, plastic packaging, 29 kilograms of food waste, and 59 kilograms of paper and cardboard each year. That's each inhabitant in the city. Uh, a life cycle analysis shows that our made waste, uh, waste management system reduced the emissions of greenhouse gases uh, with 135,000 tons in 2012. Oslo still have some... No. I still have some challenges of yours. There we go. Um, we have still have some challenges uh, um, ahead of us to reach the, uh, the goal of 50% recycling. Uh, the citizens uh, of Oslo are positive to uh, uh, um, uh, the sorting of the waste, but still many citizens uh, do not use the separation system. And our success but, uh, depends on participations, and we need to move citizens uh, towards an even more positive attitude towards this. Um, our, my first picture showed that the city of Oslo is formed by our blue fjord and our green forest, and our challenge for the future is to make the rest of the city uh, uh, a part of the green and uh, uh, circular economy. In our cities, most resources used by former and present uh, generations are present uh, in infrastructure and in homes and businesses. And the challenge is to uh, facilitate the use, uh, utilization of raw materials from spent products, buildings, and waste. Um, and to sum up, Oslo had developed a cyclic waste system where the waste is either recycled, reused, or energy recovered. A long-term political vision has formed the basis for the transformation we have gone through. While technology uh, is necessary for uh, implementation, uh, we cannot succeed without knowledge, acceptance, uh, and actions of our inhabitants, uh, and we require to communicate with them. These two pictures illustrate the transition uh, we have gone through. Seven years ago, the last landfill, you can see, uh, were uh, closed. The landfill is now under transformation, and in a few years' time, uh, we might welcome you to visit a modern uh, environmental park, including a golf field, uh, a recycling station with uh, uh, composting of garden waste, and hopefully uh, an arena of biathlon competition, if Oslo win the bid for the Winter Olympics in 2022. So I got to say that as well. Uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to taking any questions together with the rest of the uh, speakers. Uh, may I just invite Laura and Christian? We have a few more minutes uh, with the possibility of questions and comments to our speakers. Um, I would like to see if there is anybody in the public who would like to make a question. I see somebody over here. Do we have a mic? Can you please introduce yourself? And if you have a question to a specific uh, speaker, please indicate that. Uh, do we have any? Yeah, it comes there. Um. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Christoph Fender from the city of Johannesburg. Um, I would like to ask Laura, she said um, she, that one of the things are also on job creation. How many jobs are you planning to create or you think you can create in a facility like that? Or are you also planning only one facility or several of that type of facilities? Thank great, you. great question, thank you. Um, so for, for right now we're considering one facility. The city of Houston itself, we have about uh, 750,000 tons of waste, but the greater Houston area actually has uh, um, approaching 8 million tons. So if we're successful with this one facility, then others in the area, you know, there, might, there might be room for others in the area because there is a lot of waste. Um, the job creation, uh, there'll be construction jobs, obviously, but then the ongoing <clears throat> operations we calculated uh, should be about 125 jobs. So thanks for the question. Any other questions over here? 
Oh, sorry, I already got the mic here, oh. over here. Hi, my name is Sadhu you. Johnston. I'm with the city of Vancouver. Thank you all for your leadership on this issue and for sharing your work with us. That was very helpful. I, I'd like for each of you just to outline briefly what you see as the greatest challenge that your city is facing in dealing with this issue. It sounds like you're, each of the cities are in different places in some ways and are really pioneering getting people to change how they think about waste and just all of those issues, it's really complicated. And so I guess I'd be curious, what is the greatest challenge? And maybe a word or two on how you're approaching that challenge. Maybe Mayor Ruslan, if you want to start. Or I, I think the major challenge in Oslo is that we uh, produce too much waste in the first place. I think that is the overwhelming uh, challenge. I think the uh, waste uh, system we now have uh, in place uh, can play an important part in reducing the total amount of, uh, of waste we produce. Uh, and one example is, I think, when m people in Oslo had, uh, not had to, but were able to uh, sort their food waste into a green bag uh, under the kitchen sink, many of us had a uh, um, new understanding of how much food we actually throw away. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that was an eye-opener to many people. Uh, do we really need to uh, produce all this waste or could we do our uh, grocery shopping a little more uh, aware of how much waste we are going to, uh, to spend? I think this is an important part of uh, uh, how we uh, organize this waste system because it enables us to, uh, to make a uh, awareness among the population of how much uh, uh, waste we actually produce uh, throughout the year. Regarding the system, I think our main challenge is to get uh, our numbers up from uh, the, the 80s, uh, close to 100 on how many uh, take uh, part of the, of the system. And I think we have uh, uh, the communication platform in order for, uh, for us to achieve that. I will use this as a closing opportunity for all of our panelists. So thank you very much. Uh, challenges is always a good closing note. Please, Berlin. OK, um, thank you very much. I first want to agree, uh, they avoid, uh, we have to avoid waste, that's the main topic. All other things are only working on the symptoms and not on the, um, on the problem as, as itself. So uh, this is a question of information and also a question if, you, if it's visible. Uh, for me, I, in my kitchen, I also collect everything and it's really amazing how many packages you have there and how little residual waste if you separate really everything correctly and therefore we have to um, um, handle with the companies, with the traders to get less package, to get less plastic bins and so on. European Union are, is discussing about a ban of plastic bins, uh, plastic bags, sorry not plastic bins, <laughs> plastic bags um, because they are really a problem and I think important is to get the energy you, you can get from the waste and the recyclable materials as good as you can, and then we are really sustainable in this way. Thanks. That's a great question, Sadhu. Thank you. Um, so obviously, you know, they, everyone has said there's too much waste. People use too much. Obviously, that's the case, case in Houston and um, in, in the Houston region. Um, so for us, you know, the, our goals are our challenges, right? Our goals are to increase diversion, um, have ease of use for residents, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and do it either uh, do it in, in a way that's cost neutral to the city. Those those are big those are big challenges, right? Um, uh, but we're 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 trying to, to do it in in, a, in an innovative way. Um, for us, you know, if we're successful in our in our approach, it will be great. But what what one of, the, one of the areas we don't want to abandon is we don't want to abandon that idea of reuse, right? We don't want people to think just because they can now put everything into one bin that they don't have to think about separating all these things that they can, ju they, that, that they can have more waste, right? So we're gonna have a very big education campaign about reusing, about only having one bin, you know, and if you need a second bin, you're gonna get charged a lot of money for it. So we're gonna really try to institute, uh, you know, uh, education around this reuse so, so we don't have more waste, as, as, you know, as a, as, a, um, uh, as a result of this, this innovative technology, right? I mean, technology solves a lot of problems, which you know, we, we hope it will, but we also don't wanna lose that sort of, you know, individual responsibility piece to it, which, um, which, which is significant. 
Thank you so much for those very useful closing remarks, actually, on the future. I would look forward myself to be able to come back to you in a year's time and see where we stand, uh, where do we stand on the targets. They are all very ambitious, very innovative, all of the issues that you mentioned. Awareness is key. The people's behavior is key. Reducing and avoiding is key. But then, of course, technology helps, and we need to also be, uh, you know, live in a livable city in many, many ways. I'm just putting up the last slide, which will remind you all that this conversation have not finished. Um, there is, um, as you know, recently C40 launched something they call the C40 Exchange. It's a private online knowledge exchange system. And waste is part of this conversation. And Ricardo, who is just now taking a picture, he stands over there. Uh, he is the manager of this initiative, and please join. And I make a little pitch also for joining the Climate and Clean Air Coalition as well, because it's an additional uh, technical cooperation opportunity and exchange among cities who do great things with cities who want to do great things. So thank you so much again to all our three excellent speakers, Oslo, Berlin, and Houston. And thank you for all the participants. Thanks. Thank you.